Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we are truly in awe of what a good father you really are. That you call us to yourself, you call us your child. And no matter what kind of earthly father we may have had, no matter what our experiences of home might have been, you call us to yourself, you promise us a home with you. And we are so grateful for the security and the foundation that that provides in our lives. We ask you, Lord, that you would just speak to us, speak to us from your word. We, we come to you with open hearts and open ears, and we pray that you would transform us by your word. As, as we sang from glory to glory, being made more and more into the image and the likeness of Christ. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I, I wanted to start by telling you a children's story. Is that okay? You probably have already heard it because it's a very famous children's story. It's about Androclus and the lion. And it's a very famous um, fable that Aesop told. This is like, was written in the second century. And it's amazing how what was true then, it speaks to people then, speaks to us today. So let me just refresh your memories in case you remember vaguely the story. Androclus was a runaway slave. And um, in early century Rome, this was not a good thing to be. And uh, you could be put to death for running away. So he ran far from his master, and he ended up running into a cave. Now, when he got to the cave, little did he know that it was a lion's den. And um, this big old lion was there in the cave with him. Now, you know, man's natural enemy is a lion. A uh, lion would look upon man as prey and uh, dinner. But what happened within this cave was Androclus heard this growling, angry lion. And, uh, but what he saw as he observed him was that this lion was angry and growling because it had a thorn in its paw. And so Androclus approached the lion very carefully and very sweetly and very tenderly and said, let me help you. And he took his paw in his hands and he pulled the thorn from his paw. And then he treated the infection and he bound it. And the lion was so grateful because his paw healed and it became after a period of time that Androclus and the lion became very good friends. They became like best friends. And the lion was like a pet to Androclus. Well, Androclus got tired of living in a cave as a runaway slave, and he decided to take his chances, and he went back to Rome. And when he got back to Rome, he was apprehended, and he was sentenced to death but not just an ordinary death. Um, they were going to make sport out of his death, and he was taken to the Circus Maximus where he was going to be fed to the hungry lions. And when he was thrown into the arena, all the people were there ready for this incredible blood sport. The emperor was there watching. And when Androclus was released into the arena and the hungry lions were let loose, lo and behold, the hungry lion that came after him was none other than his old friend who had become his pet. And instead of this great spectacle of this lion tearing Androclus to pieces before the bloodthirsty crowd, they fell into each other's arms and embraced. And the emperor was so astonished that instead of condemning Androclus to death, he released him and granted him his freedom. And they were known to wander around Rome as partners and friends forever. And this is what they would say when he would come with his lion. He said, this is the lion, a man's friend. And this is the man, the lion's doctor. And so they made friends, these two enemies. And um, that kind of gave me my title for our message tonight. If you want to jot this down, it is, my title is Pulling Thorns and Sharing Burdens, okay? Um, we come to this last chapter of Galatians. Hasn't Galatians just opened your eyes? I've been studying the Bible a long time, and I learned so many more deep and amazing truths. I'm so appreciative of the freedom and the blessing that we have in Christ, that we're no longer trying to earn our salvation. And we, we need to be reminded of that again and again. But 
As we come to this last chapter of Galatians, I want to back up just two verses into chapter 5. And I'm going to read to you from the New Living Translation. So if you uh, don't have a New Living Bible with you, I think Jenny's going to put this up on the screen. You can follow along with me, see if I can read without any errors. <laughs> I was fumbling up all the words this morning. Um, Since we are living by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited provoking and envying each other. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks there's something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit From the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. It's so easy, isn't it, to talk about love to sing about love in an abstract or a general way. It's much harder to live it out in real life, in concrete situations, in situations that you're in today, and put these things into practice. And I want to give you four headings for my message tonight. The first one is called leveling the ground. The second one will be pulling thorns, Third one is sharing burdens, and then if we have time, we'll get to it, is sowing seeds. The first one is leveling the ground. What do I mean by that? I'm going to talk for a few minutes, going back to the last two verses of chapter 5, and talk about the relationship that we have with ourselves. Um, It's so important that we see ourselves in the proper perspective, isn't it? Now, when I was a kid growing up, Um, school pictures were just awful. Do you remember picture day at school? It was just like, I hate every single one of my school pictures. It's like, I will bury those so no one will ever see them (laughs) because no one looked good. At least I never looked good in my school pictures. They were just awful. It was the days before no filters. There was no way to review your picture, no touch-ups for your picture. They were what, what what they were, right? And, um, you know, you didn't have another chance. It's kind of like the way we take our driver's license pictures today. I mean, there is no hope with those driver's licenses. And what's so bad about them is that you've got them for like four years or longer, right? So, I mean, who wants to go to the DMV just to take a new picture? Certainly (laughs) none of us would want to do that. But I wanted to show you um, a photo, uh, not a photo, uh, a sketch that Allie did. This is my uh, youngest granddaughter. And I want to tell you how she described this picture that she drew of Papa and me, okay? (laughs) This is her comment, hashtag no filter. (laughs) She said, big Papa, and Mama has long legs. Now, she doesn't know those are just high heels, but let's let her live with that illusion too. (laughs) And this is the best part. I'm like, look, I'm going, Papa has a beard. Hmm, long beard. Wait a second. Nama has a beard too. (laughs) What is that? And this was her explanation. The lines of the face are, her words, stripes to be old. Uh, A.K.A. wrinkles. (laughs) No filters, no touch-ups. You want to know what kids think of you, and they're going to tell you the truth. You know, but what's so interesting um, in this day and age of social media and Facebook and all these other things is we can put forward an image of ourselves, can't we, that we want the world to see. You know, we just delete 
and throw in the trash all those photos that we don't like of ourselves and we get ourselves in that perfect light. We adjust the light and the dark and the balance of the image so it looks flattering to us. But you know what? We need to see ourselves in the true light that God sees us in. And if we want to just drop your eyes down, I'm going to back up to chapter 5, but then I'm going to go a little further into this. And let's look at what Paul writes about how we should relate to and see ourselves. Um, In verse 25 of chapter 5, he says, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let's not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. And then in verse 3 of chapter 6, he says, if anyone thinks there's something when they're not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. We need that right perspective on our lives. We can become so used to presenting a filtered version of ourselves to the people that we are around. We conveniently forget some of the details when we tell stories, don't we? We just leave out the parts that don't make us look so good. Um, Half-truths or we exaggerate our accomplishments, or exaggerate details about ourselves to make us look better, until we get to the point sometimes when we don't really even know who we are anymore. And we need to go back to the Word of God and ask the Lord to show us, give us a proper perspective. Because if we get the image of ourself wrong, it's going to affect every other relationship we have in life. The word that Paul uses when he says, let us not become conceited, is a really interesting word. It's a compound word in the Greek. It's kenodoxos, which means literally empty glory. Isn't that fascinating? Empty glory. It's the old King James word, vain glory. And what it's speaking about is the glory that God once bestowed upon us as his the the crown of his creation. We had this glory in Eden, but we lost that, and now we're empty. We are empty of glory until we come into our full sonship as children of God once again. But we lost that glory, and people don't realize it, that the pursuits that they have in life, the things that drive them, is they're on a search for this glory. They search for it in relationships or possessions or accomplishments or money or beauty. They search for it, and they're looking for this glory. We need to see that the way, we need to see ourselves the way God sees us. You know, I used to have a bathroom scale. Since then, we've gone all digital, and now we don't need a bathroom scale. Like, But the old one was like it was a disc that sat on like a spring, and it was pretty accurate for many years. But, I mean, it must have been like 50 years old, and you would stand on this. But one thing that was so interesting about this scale is that from morning until night, it just got off. And every day before you got on this scale, if you really wanted to know what your true weight was, you had to line that dial up with the zero. So Because at some points it would show you, you know, it would be off this way on the zero, it would be off that way on the zero, and you just would get a false read. God's word is that perfect scale that tells us what we are supposed to do, how we're supposed to see ourselves. And what happens when we don't see ourselves the way God wants us to, be, to look at ourselves? What happens? First, he tells us that we can be envious. We can be envious and we can be prideful. How do we address those issues in our lives? You know, um, two ways in which conceit will show up in our lives One way is that we provoke one another, and that word provoke means we're going to challenge each other to a contest. So we have such an inflated version of ourselves, and we see ourselves in such a light that we want to compete with others in order to show ourselves better than they are. And how do we do that? It can manifest itself in so many different ways. And everything about us becomes a competition in our relationships. We're so sure of our superiority, we want to prove it. You know, like a watching um, Chopped the other day, Chopped Impossible. Have you ever seen Chopped Impossible with Robert Irvine? He does that 
you know, that uh, cooking show or restaurant impossible where he comes and fixes all. Anyway, so he's, he's the guy that ultimately, if you win Chopped enough times, you will eventually compete with Robert Irvine. And he's this big old burly guy. And this girl came out and she says, Robert Irvine, you better watch out. I'm going to take you down. And um, she was the first one chopped. It was hilarious. It was like she had such an inflated, you know, image of herself and what she could do in the kitchen. She was the worst cook of all. And she got chopped right away. So, you know, you see this on those other shows, you know, like those um, singing competition shows. You know, it's like, you're going to lick my boots one day because you cut me and I should have been the winner. <laughs> it's like, really? Have you listened to yourself lately? Um, <laughs> But we as believers can drop the mask. We can drop the pretense. Why? Why? Because when you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and you come and you just are what you are before him, honestly before him, you learn the great balance that we all need. And that is we are hopelessly wicked and depraved, and yet God loves us and has chosen us and chosen us to one day share his glory with us. And when we see ourselves in that way, we don't look down on other people because we know we're just sinners, just like everyone else is a sinner. And then we don't look down on ourselves feeling envious and competitive. That We, you know, we just can see ourselves for who we are, that God loves us so much. What does it matter? If you win the contest or if you don't win the contest, do your best and it's great. God loves you. Both competition and envy are rooted in that same toxic soil of conceit. Paul has given us beautiful descriptions that we've already studied in Galatians. He, we're called an heir. We're a child of God. We're adopted into his family. We're also clothed in Christ. I mean, talk about having a wardrobe. You know, you have the clothing of Christ who needs to compete in those other silly areas. You know, but people have always had plenty of struggles with envy and pride, but only now, because of technology and social media, we're constantly bombarded with images that make us either feel really terrible about ourselves, that we, the more we see, the less content we are, the less satisfied we are. You know, it's just every day we need to be adjusting our image and our view of ourselves. You know, when you're feeling really low, the Word of God just picks you right up. When you're feeling all puffed up, the Word of God just deflates you, brings you right down to ground level where we ought to be. Paul also said in the New Testament, in um, Galatians chapter 1, in the New Living Testament, it, it's translated this way. He says, he says about this, he says, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing God, if pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. And then in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, he says, oh, don't worry, we wouldn't care what they, what, we wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful as those other men who tell you how important they are, but they're only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as the standard of measurement. How ignorant. You know, Paul had this image of himself that was so gospel-centered, gave him such a foundation. He never felt inferior, never felt superior. You just like that perfect middle road. Okay, so let's talk about pulling thorns. Try leveling the ground. Hopefully y'all feel a little level right now. Bathroom scale's been adjusted. You're getting a true read on who you are. Now let's look at our relationship to those who are caught in sin. You know, at some point, you're going to have someone you love, someone you know, that's going to stumble. They're going to get tripped. They're going to get snared. They're going to get entrapped. And what are you going to do? What are you going to do about that? Are you going to try to help them? You know, this is going to happen. Think about it. Maybe there's someone in your life right now that you can, you can point, you know, in your memory. You just think, okay, yeah, that's somebody I used to love, someone I care about, and they're messed up. They're having a hard time. How am I going to help them? We need to help them. And that's what this first few verses of chapter 6 tells us that we are to go after them, someone who is trapped and ensnared in sin. Don't just blow it off. Go after them. And I want to tell you another lion story. It's kind of kind of cat-heavy story this evening. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of cat stories here. Anyway, this is a true story, all right? How many of you know about Cecil the lion? It was all over the talk shows, quite a few of you. You know, Cecil the lion, right? who lived on a game preserve in Zimbabwe. 
Cecil was the king of the pride. He was this magnificent lion. And um, when, you're on a, when you're kept on a game reserve, you are um, safe from the hunters and the poachers. But Cecil one day went missing, and what they found was that these poachers were very clever. They took a, a, a bloody deer carcass, and they strapped it to the bumper of a jeep, and they drug it all around the borders of this game preserve. Now, there are no fences in this game preserve. There's no defined lines. It just, it's one side you're vulnerable, the other side you're safe. Well, they drug this deer carcass, and Cecil smelled blood and was attracted to it. And he stepped outside of the game reserve, and he was shot with a bow and an arrow. And he was wounded, and for miles they tracked him. When they finally got up to Cecil, they, they skinned him, and they cut his head off and, um, and took him as a trophy. And Cecil had fallen for the trap. But Cecil had a brother, number two lion in the pride. Cecil's brother began to care for the cubs. But one day, they all had tracking devices, these beautiful lions on this game preserve. They, the people who watch over this preserve were very, very concerned because Cecil's brother, whose name was Jericho, went missing. They couldn't find him. And he was going outside of the boundaries. This is a picture of Cecil and, um, not Cecil, of Jericho and Cecil's cubs. And um, Jericho turned out they were fearing that he might have been caught by the poachers as well, but he wasn't. And what, they con what their conjecture was, was that Jericho had left the safety of the game reserve because he was looking for his brother. He was looking for him. You know, there was a person in my life when I was in high school and I was in a backslidden state and I was really messed up and I was, um, it was my birthday and one of my very good friends who was not a Christian, obviously, um, went with me down to Laguna Beach and I began to tell her about when I used to walk with the Lord and she was just listening and she said, well, what are you doing doing this stuff for? I mean, after I began to share with her the joy and the peace that I had in Christ. And she's like, what are you doing that for? And so believe it or not, we had been high. We both bowed our heads and prayed right there. She, I was high, and she prayed to receive Christ. She's like, what are you waiting for? What are you, why are you putting it off? You know, what are you doing what you're doing? So anyway, it was like, ah, oh, you know, I had been starved for fellowship and not around many Christians. My high school, you know, weren't, weren't any of my parents didn't take me to church, and um, here I had a friend who was going to walk with me, and then the next day was Monday, and um, we had prayed together, and you know, I had rededicated my life to the Lord. She prayed to accept Christ, and it was Monday, and my sister, who was a couple years older than I was, came to me and said, hey, today's your birthday. Let's ditch school. I was like, okay, forgetting all about the fact that I had rededicated my life to the Lord. And I knew that that was a bad idea because then we did all kinds of bad stuff that day, all kinds of bad stuff. Next day on Tuesday, I show up at school, and who comes and finds me before school starts but my friend Jeannie. And she said, where were you yesterday? I said, oh, well, I ditched school. And she goes, and what did you do while you ditched school? And I told her, and the look in her eyes it was not a look of, um, you know, like, how dare you? What did you do, you stupid girl? She just looked at me. And there was such hurt there and such concern in her eyes for me. And um, there was nothing I could do. You know, it was done. You know, I'd done it. And um, bell rang, and she went to her first period class, and it was... First period was P.E., and it was tennis. I hate tennis. I, did, I could not play tennis to save my life. And no, everybody paired off, and I went behind the tennis courts, behind the backboard, and I just, like Simon and Peter, I just wept, repented, and Jeannie came after me, and we just took up, and we walked with Jesus. We found a Bible study together, and we started sharing our faith and growing together. And that girl, to this day, I owe her so much for what she did in my life. She went after me, like Jericho went after Cecil. 
you know, how do we do this? How do we go after someone in our lives that we care about? The New Living Testament again says, you that are spiritual should gently and humbly help that person back to the right path. Ephesians 4.15 says that we are to speak the truth to one another in love. And Jude chapter 1, verse 22 to 23 says, show mercy to those who have doubts. Save others by snatching them from the fire. And to others, show mercy with fear. Do you see all the different ways and approaches? You know, you speak the truth in love. So you show mercy to those who are doubting. Others, you're aggressive. You go in there and you just snatch them. You know, saving them from the fire. And then to others, you show mercy with fear. All those different approaches, you know. You know, every one of us is naturally wired one way or another. We're, we're either diplomatic or we're direct, right? And, um, you know, this is really hard in relationships to strike the perfect balance in people's lives. It's like we want to get it right. We want to be truthful. We want to tell them what's going on. But at the same time, we want to do it in a way in which their hearts will be open and they'll receive it from us, right? Over and over again, we read of the balance that we need. And um, just for fun and a show of hands here, how many of you in this room would consider yourself non-confrontational? You don't really like to, yeah, okay, I'm kind of there with you. Um, and I know there's probably a few more of you, but you're sitting there and you're thinking, I, this is a little too confrontational and I'm not going to raise my hand. <laughs> so that's okay, just relax, you, you'll be all right. Now, how many of you out there would consider yourself truthful and direct? You'd rather deal with it sooner than, yeah. You know what's really funny? Same, same response in the morning service because the girls who are non-confrontational, they go like this. The girls who are more direct, they're like this, two hands up, and they're quick about it too. <laughs> this is pretty funny, you know, at least we know who we are, right? Um, those of you um, that are non-confronters, you may be unwilling, naturally, to go after someone who is caught in sin. You may feel, hey, listen, who am I to judge, right? Um, live and let live. Uh, it's not my affair. I don't want to get involved. Um, so you basically find yourself sort of backing off and doing nothing and saying nothing. And then there's the other extreme. You know, and you know what you do. <laughs> you are very direct. And you will go face to face to that person and you will confront them. And you have no problem confronting them and telling them the truth about themselves. The only problem is sometimes you do it without much um, deference, without much tact. And so, you know, you're kind of like drive-by shooting. You know, give me, give me that weapon. I'm going after them. <laughs> And I'm just going to tell them what they need to hear. Who in the world can strike the perfect balance of, you know, toughness and tenderness, you know, truth and love, but Jesus Christ, right? Jesus is the only one who ever got it perfectly right 100% of the time. Just think about Mary and Martha and Lazarus. You know, um, Lazarus was um, brother of Mary and Martha, and he died. And then Jesus... Um, comes to the place of Bethany, and he is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, but the two sisters don't know that. And Martha, the direct one, the bold one, the aggressive one, the one who would seek to tell Jesus exactly what he should do with, his sister, with her sister Mary, um, she approaches Jesus, and she says, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died and Jesus, knowing how to deal with the Marthas of the world, really challenges her faith, really goes after her, really says, you know what, Martha? You know, I am the resurrection and the life. Your brother will live again. And Martha says, I know he's going to live again. No, just let me tell you. Do you believe that your brother will live again? And he has this kind of more prolonged conversation with Martha. He's just like, come on, Martha. Come up here. But then Mary, you know, 
This is what's so fascinating when you read the story. There's, there's so much to this story, but this one aspect of it has always fascinated me. Mary comes to Jesus, and she says exactly the same thing. You know, she's totally different personality type, but she says the same words. She says, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Now, what does Jesus do? Now, if it was you or me, you know, same, same words, kind of the same situation, we'd probably do the same thing to Mary that we did to Martha, but not Jesus. Jesus says nothing, but he just weeps. And knowing how to deal with people, Jesus knew what Martha needed. Jesus knew what Mary needed. So when do we do this? When do we do this? Well, we do this when we're trying to restore someone who is caught in sin, we get involved in their life. But let me tell you, it isn't every time you see someone sin, every time someone slips, you are not to necessarily go and confront them over that sin. Paul warns Timothy, he talks about these idlers. He says they go about from house to house, and um, they're not only idlers, but they're gossips and they're busybodies saying what they should not. You know, they're hypercritical. You know, we used to call them in, way back in the day with the sin sniffers and the flesh finders. They're always like looking for that person who isn't doing everything quite right, looking down their noses at them, um, criticizing this, criticizing that, you know. Love covers a multitude of sins. Listen, people are in a process, especially new and younger believers. They're in, they're in process. Give them some grace to grow. Lead them gently. You know, you don't have to always go and confront them every time. You go at this very cautiously, very prayerfully. When is there the time to step in? Let me tell you, it's not every time someone goofs up. It's not every time someone stumbles. This is someone who is caught. They're caught. They're trapped. You have to give, you know, over a period of time you observe this about them. Wow, they really seem to be struggling in this one area. This is kind of a repeated behavior in their life. Not only are they caught, but they're somewhat oblivious to the fact that they're caught. And you see that about them. You see like your child, you know, someone you love, your child, and they're like making really bad decisions. When is the right time to just sort of lay it all out? You know, Greg, so many times is so much better at this than I was. You know, I would major on the minors. He said, Kathy, that is not the hill you want to die on. You know, let the big things be big. Let go how they dress or let go some of these other things. You know, what really matters is their walks with the Lord. Deal with the big issues. Let this other stuff maybe not be such a major deal. You know, or you maybe have a friend, maybe a friend who's making all kinds of really bad financial decisions, you know, and you see them there, just getting into credit card debt, and they're just out there every time you see them. They got some new outfit and some new pair of shoes, and they're going here and they're going there, and you know that they're struggling to pay their rent. And you're thinking, well, wait a second, you know, this is not wise. You, you know, when, you know, you know, eventually it's going to be devastating to their lives. When is it that you actually step out and say, hey, you know, excuse me, I'm just not really, I, you know, I may have this totally wrong. Maybe there's something else going on that I'm not aware of, but let me, let me tell you what I think I see and let's pray about this together. Or maybe it's a relative, right? You know, Thanksgiving's coming up. Maybe it's somebody that you know is always critical. They come to your family gatherings, it's like they're always so negative. It's nobody wants to be around. They criticize, they're negative, they're judgmental, they're complaining. Nothing is ever quite right. They're just an overall pain in your backside. And, and everyone else, every family has at least one of these, right? And if you're just sitting there going, no, my family doesn't, maybe you are the one. That <laughs> maybe it's you. You know, when you think, okay, you know, at some point you may want to stand up in your family and say, you know, um, in our family, we're just not going to treat each other like this anymore. Let's, let's deal with this. Let's talk about this. Or maybe you have a friend who has three cats, and they're going out and they're going to buy another cat. And you're like, okay, this is the time to intervene. I am not going to let you become the cat lady. You are no not going to buy another cat because I love you and I care about you and for heaven's sake don't get another cat you're going to intervene in their lives let me just tell you Greg we have a cat living in our house now 
a cat that Allie brought on her birthday, and it's a really cute cat. The cat is totally perfect. Never comes in our house, stays in their house. Very sweet little cat. But um, we went out to dinner, and some friends showed us a picture of their cat. And I have a picture I have to show you. So this is really a cat sermon tonight. Look at this cat. This is a, what is it called? It's a ragdoll mink. It is hypoallergenic, and this cat, uh, this cat knows it's beautiful, doesn't it? Is that a pose, or is that a pose? The, the couple that we know that had this cat actually says this cat, when they're having company, he's pretty minds his own business. It's more like a dog than a cat is what they say, but this cat, when the company comes over, actually parades around for attention, and then he, he'll jump up, and he'll just turn and pose. It's like, you can take my picture now. I told the girls, she takes the most amazing, she sent me like five or six pictures of these cats, uh, of her cat, and um, I'm like, oh my gosh, you should start, just post these on Instagram, you'd have a jillion followers, this cat's amazing. <laughs> so what do you think Greg did when we got home after having dinner with these people? She, Don't tell anybody, he was on the internet looking up these cats, it was so funny. <laughs> So no, but don't let me become that cat lady if you see us going down that road. We have one cat, we have two cats, maybe no more. But even if you see someone doing something and it's repeated, but you see them, they're aware of it. They're struggling. They're struggling and they feel really bad when they mess up and they feel bad when they're stumbling and they feel bad about it and they're repentant. They don't need a confrontation. They need prayer. They need support, right? Paul isn't talking about people like that. He's talking about those that are doing this and they're unaware of it. So who is supposed to do this? Paul says, you who are spiritual. Now, this isn't what you may think. It's just, oh, it's only the experts that can be doing this. No, I've only been a Christian 17 years. I don't know enough to go confronting people and dealing with. Let me tell you, my girlfriend, Jeannie, she was one day old in the Lord, but she was walking in the Spirit. One day old. And she took my life and she set it on the right track. It's not just the experts and the professionals. You, my sister in Christ, this is what you're called to, to go after someone who is caught in sin. Pray about it. Your role is to bring them back into proper alignment. The word um, to restore, we learned in our lesson this week, it was a, a joint that was uh, a bone that was out of joint, Right? Uh, or a broken bone. But another way to, uh, the word is used is to mend a torn net. When the disciples were mending their nets that day, and I love that picture because it speaks more of a process. It's, it's meticulous and painstaking and detailed work, and you have to do it carefully and gently and properly, or you might mess it up. That's kind of the picture when we're going to restore somebody. It may not be a quick fix. It may not be an instant solution. They may not come to their senses, but you're in it for the long haul. You're invested in their lives. The New Living Testament again says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by a sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Your goal is not to prove that you're right and they're wrong. So go gently. Go humbly, everything from the tone of your voice to the words that you choose to the setting that you choose to have this conversation, all of it is designed to heal. We get it so wrong. I've done it so wrong so many times. And I ask the Lord, forgive me and help me. And I, you have to go and apologize to people later on. You're just like, maybe did it too, too confronted. Maybe you were not thinking about the setting or not thinking about the proper time. It was, it was just a difficult difficult moment for the both of you. Humbly and gently do this. You know, we've all had doctors who have treated us, right? Some have treated us gently. Some of, it, some of them go at it so, so wonderfully, so sweetly, so delicately, you know, like a, like a surgeon with the finest tools, and some were just blunt. I'll never forget one doctor. My son Christopher had um, pneumonia, terrible pneumonia, and they needed to get an x-ray of his lungs. And he was so fragile and so weak, and he didn't want to sit still to take the x-ray. And this doctor's assistant came in there and was just like, if you don't hold him, we're going to have to strap his arms down. I mean, no, she wanted, I, the goal was to get a proper image of his lungs, and he had to hold still for it. But 
her whole demeanor only upset him. It upset me. It got to such a degree. I said, I can't, I can't do this. I can't hold him. He's, he's crying. He's gasping for air. I cannot restrain him. I had to leave. It was just awful. You know, the, her, her end game was right, but her, her whole demeanor, her whole approach was wrong. So when you do it, just do it cautiously. Do it carefully. And then remember that you yourself might be in, um, in not in a place to be doing this. Jesus warned about someone who had a speck of sawdust in their eye and was going after the plank in the other person's eye. I mean, it's just really a comical picture, right? You know, this person with this giant two-by-four trying to pick at some microscopic thing in someone else's eye, and Jesus is saying, get the plank out of your own eye. Don't go doing surgery on somebody else. You're going to hurt someone doing that. Take, take care of your issues at home first so that... Um, so that you can see clearly enough to help somebody else. You know, how many times have we heard of leaders who harp on certain sins? You know, really, that's every sermon. Every sermon is about this one thing, only to find out later on that they themselves were entrapped by that very sin. They had that plank in their eye, they couldn't see clearly. Let's get to the second part where it talks about sharing of burdens. You know, pulling thorns is one thing, but sharing burdens is a whole nother subject. I'm not talking about a person who's trapped in sin here. We're thinking about the, our relationship to somebody who is burdened. We're told bear or carry or share one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. How do you share someone else's burden? Imagine someone is under this crushing weight. You know, someone's trying to lift something that's heavy and they can barely stand up under the weight of it. How do you help them? I mean, literally, if you were to see somebody who was trying to lift something too heavy, how would you do it? You would get right next to them. You'd get practically inside their shoes in order to get under that weight to help them lift it, right? You have to get under that burden yourself. You have to feel the pressure of it. You have to feel what they're feeling. You have to get in almost in their shoes. You know, that word understand, interestingly, comes from the word to stand under. You need to get that close to see it through their eyes, to think about what they're experiencing. To bear someone's burden, you're going to need to listen to them until you understand, until you stand under that weight. Imagine that weight coming on you and then trying to lift that burden with them. And from my experience, ladies, this is a great gift to give someone. Someone who's struggling, someone who's sad, someone who's grieving, someone who's dealing with an ongoing trial and it's weighing them down to come alongside them. Can we fix everything? No, we can't fix everything. But we can sure come alongside them and just listen. And I'm telling you, the greatest gifts that I've received in my life from my friends have not been presents wrapped with bows. It's not been that. It's been someone who stood beside me in those moments when I was going through the toughest things and they didn't even say a word. And no, we were not a lot of fun to hang around when we were going through those, that terrible season of grief that we went through. Um, but they came, they'd take us out to dinner, they'd sit at lunch, and just the tears in their eyes and just the compassion by just listening. And you know what? Nothing had really changed. As far as our situation had gone, there was nothing anyone could really do to fix it. But you know what? Spending time as they listened and as I just unloaded and just unloaded the things I was feeling or the things I was learning, or I just felt my burden lightened. You know, it wasn't completely fixed. It was just lightened. And I was so grateful for that. What a gift that is. Because they'd practically gotten in my shoes. First Peter tells us that we must cast our cares on the Lord. He cares for us. But one of the ways that he cares for us is in friendship, isn't it? That's why the Virtue Bible study is so cool. Because, you know, you may not have people in your life that are, that are in the same mindset that can help you, that will stand with you, that will pray with you, that will come alongside you and listen to you. Bearing your burdens. He bears these burdens for us sometimes through human friendship, and that's how they are fulfilling the law of Christ. They're planting seeds. Why? Why do we plant seeds? Why do we go to the trouble? 
Why do we invest time? Why do we invest energy? Why do we even invest our money in helping someone bear their burden? Why? When it costs us so much, it's because in due season, we will reap an eternal harvest if we faint not. An eternal harvest. Jonathan Edwards says, if we are never obliged to relieve another's burdens, Without burdening ourselves, then how are we to bear another's burdens when we bear no burden at all? It does cost us to bear someone else's burden. And you might say, well, I, I can't afford the time. I can't afford to give because it means I might not be able to do the things I want to be able to do. You know, I don't want to sit with this grieving person. I don't want to hear about their prodigal child. I don't want to go over to their house and, you know, deal with the issues they're dealing with. You know what? It's a gift. And that gift is sowing a seed. It's planting a seed. And it's helping. Alan Redpath, who is a great man of God who wrote wonderful books, in his early life he was uh, destined to be an accountant. He had gone to school and that's what he was going to live, a comfortable life. And he had received Christ as his savior and Christ was in this compartment of his life and the rest was his career and he was heading off that direction and and he felt the calling of the Lord to do something. He felt the calling of the Lord in his heart to serve God full time in ministry and, and he didn't want to do it. He had his career path set out for him and he took a train and he was on his way heading like Jonah in another direction and he says, well, he was on that train, the the train, the clickety-clack of the train, he kept hearing something over and over again, saved soul, wasted life, saved soul, wasted life, saved soul, wasted life. It's possible to have a saved soul and a wasted life. You will live a sad and barren life if you're not willing to sow those seeds, to plant those seeds, to invest your life in the kingdom and in the lives of other people. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, right? That was our memory verse. Whatever you sow, that will you reap. You sow to the flesh. It's all about you. It's all about your time. It's all about your hobbies. It's all about your finances. It's always about you. You reap a harvest of just that, of emptiness and a barren life. But if you plow into people's lives and you invest in people's lives, oh, the happiest people I know are people who do this. I like the saying, I am only one, but I still am one. I can't do everything, but I can do something. And because I can't do everything, I will not refuse to do the something I can do. Don't think, well, I mean, their problems are so huge. The needs of the world are so great. Look at all the starving children. Look at all the sex trafficking. Look at all the calamities. Look at the refugees. Look at the people on the streets in Skid Row. Look at the people, all, you know, and we're all so desensitized because it's all these nebulous things far, far away. What about the people in your life right now? What about the people that are right next to you in your home, in this church, in your neighborhood? What about them? Do something small. Even if it's all you can do, just something small. You know, here I am. I'm going to be 60 next year. And I was just thinking about this as I was writing this message. I will never forget a third grade teacher that I had. This third grade teacher, and I was like a pretty average student, average kid. Um, just sort of blend into the background. And I'll never forget my third grade teacher who singled me out in a class and said, you come up here and you help me. And she let me cut out daisies to decorate the bulletin board. I mean, how insignificant is that? But you know what? To this day, I remember how I felt to just come alongside a junior high girl who's just struggling with her identity, feeling like a nobody, to just come alongside and just plow into her life. I mean, who knows what could happen for you just sowing that little seed? What difference will your small efforts make? Trust me, they will make a lot. How do we bear these burdens? So much going on in the world without feeling the crushing weight of it on ourselves, without feeling the responsibility to try to fix everything for everyone. And sometimes when you get so involved in someone's life and you give and you give and you give and there's still such a need and you start feeling yourself getting depressed and frustrated because you aren't seeing 
an impact. How do you deal with that? Let me tell you that you may not really be helping that person by being too overly involved. You need to be able to commit that person to Jesus. He's responsible for their salvation. He's responsible to bring the prodigal home. He's responsible to let that person start applying the truths of the word of God. You do what you can do, and then you present that to Jesus and let it go. You may not be trusting Jesus to be the Savior only Jesus can be. He is the ultimate burden bearer. Amen? And we need to remember that. He bore our griefs. He was wounded for our sins. He was crushed for our iniquities. He ultimately bears our burdens, and he helps us bear the burdens of others. Christ had that perfect ministry, that perfect balance of truth and tears, of truth and love, of grace and truth, balancing, all the time balancing. And he committed his life to Christ. Um, he committed his life to God, and what a difference it made in our lives. You know, what a difference that little bit that we can do for someone else might make in their lives. Psalm 34, verse 8 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and to he who is crushed in spirit. You know, the psalmist had no idea just how close Jesus can be. But Isaiah 53 tells us that he took up our infirmities and he bore our sorrows. There's only one person who can do that completely and perfectly, and that is Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that Jesus Christ did come into this world to bear our burdens so that we don't have to avoid them and so that we don't have to be crushed by them. Lord, we don't want to avoid helping someone else and we don't want to be crushed by the responsibility as if it was all up to us to fix people's lives. We, we want to be exactly in that place where we need to be. Thank you that we can come to you as a people who have the need to be taught the balance between truth and love, that we might have that ministry that Jesus had in the lives of those that we care about. Make us a church that has this balance. Lord, may we represent you well in this world, in our friendships, in our relationships, Lord. Thank you for all that you did for us. Thank you for all that you are doing for us. And we cast our cares upon you tonight, for you are able to bear those burdens as no one else can. We thank you in Jesus' name.